It's a real pleasure to be here today. It's my, my first time in Riga, which is definitely a lovely place to be. And of course, I would like also to thank the organizing committee of this event, especially to Dennis for having me here in this wonderful place, in the wonderful new building. And thank you uh, to the library too, of course. And uh, thank you for coming here to listen to me today. Well, we are um, here today to speak about historical memory in Spain. And I think that this is an appropriate moment to do it because over the last few years, uh, the mainstream narrative of our recent past in Spain have been challenged by other discourses that are demanding different approaches to the past in order to build a, a new future. So it's a good moment to remember where we do come from in Spain in, term, in terms of memory, just to properly understand the present debates uh, which are, needless to say, more political than historical. In doing that, I have divided my presentation into three main parts and two preliminary considerations, just to clarify my approach to the central questions I suggest here today, which are, what do we mean in Spain when we say historical memory, and why? What is the mainstream narrative about the recent past in Spain and again, why is precisely that? So firstly, I will very briefly refer to the Francoist historical memory, mentioning some of the pseudo-historical myths in which the regime was based. Secondly, I'll, ad I'll address the period, I think I have here, yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, I'll address the period of transition to democracy after Franco's death in December 1975 a period that became, in my opinion, the foundational myth of the new Spain. And thirdly, uh, as the central part of my presentation, I will refer to the so-called memory boom, meaning a renewed interest in memory, mainly caused by the activities of the social mov uh, movement that has brought to the forefront of public agenda the memory of the victims of Franco's repression. And after that, I'll try to draw, draw some conclusions and look a bit to the future. <clears throat> but first, let's move to the two preliminary considerations. The first one has to do with the political dimension of historical memory. Historical memory is a lot of things, but it is also a political project for the present that refers to the past to justify or propose something in the present for the future. Often, those political goals involved identity construction and the modification or conservation of our worldviews. The relationship with our past also defines our present, so it's critical to pay attention to it. Marc Ferro states that to control the past is to master the present, to legitimize dominion and to justify legal claims. And he is probably partly right. We will see how Franco tried to build a historical justification of his regime and the narrative created for that purpose flew through educational system and the media for almost 40 years. But, but as Todorov points out, historical memory can be also an ethical and political project to act in the present and to construct a different future. So it can be a good tool for emancipation, defending human rights or for peace building, not only as we sometimes see it as a tool to intensify memory wars. Memory is also, as indicates the philosopher Regis Mate, a way of making visible what was made invisible and reclaim uh, the victim's approach. Memory is an act of justice because there is no possibility of real justice without remembering in injustice. Moreover, we remember and forget to a great degree collectively. Memory is always selective and the results of that selection get, a, get to us through a certain discourse. The discourse crystallizes in different ways. Textbooks, documentaries, movies, museums, monuments, video games, etc. I actually believe that we have to pay more attention to this relationship between the mediations and the shape of historical memory. 
uh, memories in plural, I would say. In our time, the omnipresence of mass media in everyday life imply a decisive role of the media in shaping the way we remember. Film industry, TV series or newsmaking have a lot to do with how we think about the past or about certain figures of our history. And with the part of that history, we, in inverted commas, decided to remember as a society. So in my opinion, it makes sense to link the study of memory policies to communication policies. The selection, the selection of a part of our past to be preserved implies a hierarchical organization of the past. What is preserved and commemorated is at the top of the hierarchy. On the other hand, what is not preserved becomes censored and out of the public memory. The selection criteria is often political and leads us to the promotion of certain representation of the past at the expense of others. Summing up, for me, historical memory is a matter of social justice and also a political, uh, in the best sense of the word, project for the future. Memory is also the discourse of memory which is always medi mediated by education, the media, etc. So in my view, any policies of memory have to be successful, to be linked to communication policies. Let's move to the second preliminary consideration, which has to be directly with the Spanish case. <clears throat> Every country has, of course, its own conflicts with the past. The atrocious 20th century has been a really prolific trauma-making period. Spain is not an exception. A bloody civil war from 1936 to 1939, and after that, almost 40 years of dictatorship uh, have left a profound mark in Spanish society. In fact, when we say in Spain historical memory, we usually mean what happened in that period. And to be more specific, we often mean Franco's repression during and after the war. But you might ask, why just Franco's repression? There was a war, and it's difficult to imagine a war without atrocities committed by both sides. And you are right, there were of course atrocities on, both, uh, atrocities on both sides, and the suffering during the war was everywhere. But there are at least three difference, differences that deserve to be underlined. First, from 1931 to 1936, and in fact to 1939 in some areas of the country, there was a legitimate regime in Spain, the Republic. For his part, General Franco carried out a military coup against a legitimate government. You will probably agree if I say that these are different starting positions. Franco knew that, and that is the reason why he insisted again and again in his propaganda on the illegitimate origin of the Republic. The second difference, Furthermore, there is a central difference uh, between both sides in terms of repression in the, rear guard, in the rear guard. The government of the Republic tried, although not always success, uh, uh, successfully, that's true, to stop the violent actions on, uh, of some non-government forces, because these actions were against the Republican law. In Franco's side, repression was understood as a central part of the military strategy. General Franco pointed out this very expressively, I will save Spain from Marxism, whatever, is, whatever the cost. It will, I will not hesitate to kill half the population if that is necessary to bring peace to the country. And the third difference is that the victims of Franco's side were buried and honored with all kinds of rituals, monuments, speeches, etc. during 40 years uninterrup uninterruptedly. Immediately after the war, Franco started a very detailed investigation of the so-called Red Terror. This investigation, that was called the General Cause, documented what happened to almost every victim of the, Republic, of the Republicans. The documents are in open archives, you can see them actually in internet, and as uh, the, histo the historian Francisco Espinosa highlighted, Neither the families nor the researchers had problems with documenting that repression. The problem was the other repression. For obvious reasons, dictator, the dictatorship wasn't so accurate in investigating its own atrocities. On the contrary, many people were killed without a trace, just disappeared. 
Many of them were buried in mass graves and they are still there. The existing documents are scattered and the access to them has been difficult or impossible for a long time after the death of Franco. So the Republicans who died during the war and as a result of the repression after it were humiliated and abandoned in mass graves where the bodies of illegally executed people were buried. In Spain, it wasn't definitely the same growing up in a victor's family than growing up in a Republican family. There wasn't any kind of compassion with the defeated. Instead of that, persecution, segregation and humiliation. There are still tens of thousands of people in that mass graves, but we will return to this uh, later. In, in brief, the victims of the victorious side were dignified while the vanquished side were repressed or in exile. I think these differences are important to be underlined in order to get a better understanding on the controversies of memory in contemporary Spain. That being said, let's move to the first point of my presentation. <clears throat> the Francoist historical memory. As Professor again Francisco Spinoza points out, Franco's dis dictatorship was a real school of historical memory. The absolute control of the media, education and culture allowed the propagandist of the regime to disseminate on a massive scale a mythical narrative of Spanish history full of references to the brave Spanish race and its historical role on saving the world from the permanent threat of international communism. Franco legitimized his violent new order by reference to an ultra-conservative reading of Spanish history, one that had significantly been challenged under the Republic. Helen Graham is right when she claims that Franco erected a repressive myth of a monolithic Spanish nation born in the 15 centuries with the Catholic Church, where hi hierarchy and cultural hom homogeneity guaranteed by fundamentalist Catholicism had generated imperial greatness." End of the quotation. That was the lost Spain Franco wanted to recover. In fact, Franco saw himself as successor of the Catholic kings and the Spanish conquerors from 16th and 17th centuries. He felt himself responsible for maintaining what he considered the national values of Spanish race, that is to say, Catholicism, authoritarianism, and the fight to liberalism and Marxism, seen as corrosive ideology uh, for those values. The historical, the historical narrative resulting from that approach was openly imperialistic, having all the ingredients of the imperial propaganda uh, of the 19th century. Racism, anti-Semitism, militarism, chauvinist nationalism, and of course, uh, Catholicism. Franco was the man Destined, destined to lead the recovering of the glory of the old times. The old times meaning, of course, the Spanish Empire. And that narrative flew through the educational system and the media. Actually, uh, a good example of this approach is a film, this is the poster, called Race from 1941, based in an idea of General Franco. The film is awful, but uh, at the same time, as a, as a movie is awful, but at the same time, a good ideological compendium on Francoism uh, and its views on history. I suggest you to watch this film if you are interested in, in know which were these views. Uh, that propagandistic use of, but just in that case, hmm. uh, that propagandistic use of the past glorified authoritarianism. And the glorification had, in my view, clear political consequences. To put it in short, if I feel proud of an authoritarian past, if I identify my country's periods of glory with those of empire and authoritarian rule, it's more likely that I take a favorable, favorable look to similar policies in the present. So in that sense, I think we Spaniards have food for thought. Um, According, <coughs> according to this uh, Francoist version of history, was the spirit, uh, uh, Spain was the spiritual reserve of the Western world. And in fact, the civil war was 
interpreted as a crusade, as you can see in this, in this uh, poster, uh, this is a poster of the 30s uh, during the Civil War, and this is a picture who, uh, who is located in the um, Valley of the Falls, the place uh, in which Franco is uh, buried. Uh, so it was uh, this story was interpreted as a crusade against communism and of course the Judeo-Masonic conspiracy behind it. A central topic of Franco's use of history was the justification of the Cop d'Etat in 1936, the Cop that started the Civil War. One of the main arguments uh, and the one that very soon became the central one uh, of, for uh, propaganda purposes was that the Republic was at the service of the Soviet Union. Franco repeated once and again that they had to fight an, an enemy, the Republic, which received permanent military supplies from the Soviet Union. He of course didn't mention so often the much bigger military help he received from the Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. Uh, for Franco was crucial, especially after the Second World War, uh, to be seen as the champion of the war against communism as he was trying to survive in the Europe of the Cold War. This version of history was repeated once and again by all possible means of propaganda during 40 years. 40 years of tiresome propaganda left, of course, a mark in the view of history of many Spaniards, especially because there wasn't after the death of the dictator, a total change in the narrative of history. So let's have a closer look to what happened then. Franco died in December 1975, after almost 40 years in power. <clears throat> in the years immediately after the death of the, the dictator, Spain went through an intense period of crucial political changes. Political parties were legalized in 1975. Multi-party elections were held for the first time since 1936. A year later, a new constitution was approved. The political climate of uh, those years was a mixture of political tension, economic crisis, social mobilization, political violence, hope in the future, and also, and also resistance to change. The most clear example of this resistance was actually the attempted Cop d'Etat on 23 February 1981. Spain was changing, but at the same time, there wasn't neither a radical breakup with the past, nor a substantial symbolic dismantling of the dictatorship. In fact, the period of transition to democracy was conducted mainly, not only, but mainly from inside the regime, by the new, queen, by the new king, Juan Carlos, designated by Franco, and Adolfo Suarez, the new prime minister, a young reformist who was the minister's secretary general of the national movement, the political structure that supported the regime for 38 years. After a few years, at the beginning of the 80s, the period of transition to democracy started to become a sort of foundational myth of the new state, a period described in textbooks or the media frequently in idyllic terms, as a time of consensus, a moment when Spaniards, for the first time in history, put aside their differences and brought to the forefront of the public debate the need for social agreement an agreement symbolized in the new constitution and in the politi politicians involved in, his, in its writings, who became a sort of founding fathers of the new Spain. The myth, a hegemonic discourse, was disseminated through textbooks, museums again, books, documentaries, movies, TV series, and a partial street rename, remain, renaming. This mystification of the transition period and his heroes has been mainstream in Spain during more than 30 years. Only recently, in a context of economic crisis and political change, the transition period is being revisited and discussed, not only in university, but also, to some extent, by the whole civil society. But uh, there were 
of course, this positive changes in direction of democracy. But the dark side of the myth was that also included some forgetting. As Andreas <coughs> Huysen points out in relation to the myth of progress, the price of, for progress was the destruction of past ways of living and being in the world. There was no liberation without active destruction, and the destruction of the past brought forgetting. In my view, that's applicable to the new Spain, lived from, from 1982 by the Socialist Party and trying to be seen as a country of progress and, uh, progress and prosperity, a country integrated in international organizations like NATO or after that the European Union. Spain wasn't anymore the country that Federico García Lorca brilliantly described it in the house of Bernarda Alba. But the commemoration of the new political landscape included, as we have said, forgetting by silencing the, the stories of the victims of the civil war and the dictatorship. That seemed to, to be the price to pay. The so-called unwritten agreement for silence on this issue was an attempt to put the past behind and concentrate on the future of Spain. Looking to the future, to the modern and European new Spain, seemed to be incompatible with remembering the victims in the past, and they were forgotten. The pact uh, underpinned the transition to democracy of the, uh, of the 1970s and ensured that controversial questions about the recent past were suppressed for fear or endangering national, national reconciliation and peaceful coexistence. So rather than forming a truth commission to come to terms with war crimes, the main Spanish right and left parties agreed to draw a curtain on history after the death of Franco in 1975 in that pact of silence which was given a legal basis in the amnesty law of 1977, sorry, which covers all crimes of, of a political nature committed prior to December 1976. The law allowed many political prisoners to get out of jail, that's, that's true, but at the same time closed the doors for future attempts to judge the crimes of the dictatorship. In fact, Spanish courts have routinely closed investigation into abuses committed during the civil war and the dictatorship by invoking this law, the amnesty law. For the proposers of the law, the law was seen as an attempt to start with a clean state the new period of Spanish history and for some of them uh, to assure themselves a quiet future. To summarize, Spanish tra uh, transition to democracy brought positive changes for the country but also was built on the silence of a part of the traumatic past and on the forgetting of the victims. We might understand that in a certain moment, the late 70s, some issues were put aside or ignored because of the fear of a new confrontation between Spaniards that can be understood. But to declare today, as many do, that in those years wounds were healed, that we came to terms with our past, or that we reached full reconciliation between the so-called two Spains, that, in my opinion, is a bit of an exaggeration. So for a very, very long time, almost nothing was said in textbooks or in mainstream media about the victims of Francoist repression, nothing about the missing persons uh, caused by the dictatorship. That situation changed at the beginning of the uh, 20, uh, 21st century. Let's see why moving to the third part of my presentation. The memory boom. Antonius Robbins states that when major atrocities are committed, and that is the case of Franco's repression, very often societies need to repress or at least silence the, atro the atrocities for a long time because they are not ready to face the many dead or admit their own complicity in the killings. So the question arises, are we ready as Spaniards to admit what happened decades ago? Are we at least ready to openly, and I want to underline this, openly speak about that? 
The short answer would probably not always. According to Paul Preston, behind the line is a quote, uh, behind the lines during the Spanish Civil War, nearly 200,000 men and women were murdered extrajudicially or executed after flimsy legal process. Perhaps as many as 200,000 men died at the battlefront. In all Spain, after the final victory of the rebels at the end of March of 1939, approximately 20,000 rep republicans were executed. Others died in Spanish, French or Nazi concentration camps and around half a million republicans were forced into exile. Because of the nature of repression, it is absolutely impossible to give an exact number of missing persons. We can't both accurately calculate the number uh, of mass graves and people buried in them. This will be always a never-ending, ongoing project. So taking numbers cautiously, and according to the historian Francisco Espinosa, there were more than 100,000 missing peoples, many of them, until now, buried in mass graves all around the country, probably tens of thousands. The fact is that only around 5,300 um, um, uh, 5, corpses have been exhumed yet. Just to put that figures in context, Spanish population was, in 1936, of around 24 million. There are a lot of people in Spain that know nothing or very little about this. As shows the very, the very few surveys conducted in Spain on this topic. Um, during a quarter century after the death of Franco, the debate about the Francoist repression was limited to historians, which, by the way, found all kinds of legal or pseudo-legal impediments to access the archives. In respect to the administration, the usual attitude of the different Spanish governments has been apathy, indifference and passivity. For a significant part of the Spanish population, the politics of silence led to a huge lack of knowledge about the scale of repression during and after the war. As a result of that, many just put both sides of the conflict at the same level in terms of repression. And there is a substantial amount of historical research available to refute this version of history. But as we know, historical books not always become mainstream. The point is that mainstream media, also infected with this politics of silence, has not stimulated curiosity on these issues, what is probably necessary to put memory on the agenda. In this context, again, the current hegemonic narrative is a mixture of new approaches, approaches to the past, plus the myth of the transition and reminders of Franco's interpretation of history. But getting back to the politics of silence. Something, cha something changed. Oh, no, it's, yeah. Something changed in, to, in 2000 with the opening of a mass grave with 13 corpses in Priaranza del Bierzo, placed in the north of Spain. The event marks a milestone for the social movements related to historical memory. In some way, the opening of the Civil War mass graves uh, released part of the previously silent suffering. It wasn't the first grave opened, but it was the first time that the opening was carried out with the help of archaeologists and forensic scientists. And this is crucial, the media was there. The silence of decades was, to some extent, broken. The media covered the opening and the grave of the grave, sorry, and brought Franco's repression into the public arena, and Spanish society began to question the mainstream narrative of the civil war and, and, and the dictatorship. After the opening of this mass grave, the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory was created with the aim of collecting the oral and written testimonies of the victims of Franco's regime and excavating and identifying their bodies that were often dumped in mass graves. In 2006, for example, started the opening of the biggest mass grave found until now. Uh, <clears throat> 2,840 persons were exhumed 
in the cemetery of San Rafael in the city of Malaga, in the south of Spain. And after the creation of that first association came dozens of others. The memory boom started and the crimes committed during the civil war and the dictatorship became, at least for a while, a subject for public debate. In all these years, the concept of historical memory, and according to the historian Angel Viñas, has gathered together those who don't want a dictatorship to continue dictating the evolution of Spanish society. The movement for the recovery of historical memory has given political, social, and cultural dimension to memory matters in Spain, and in some way forced different administrations to take a stand, or at least not to maintain an awkward silence. But it doesn't mean that the issue became less controversial. The Spanish state ignored the civil war executions and the presence of mass graves between uh, the 39th and 2000, from 1975, known of the two big political parties in office from 1982 paid attention to the victims. So their families started to organize themselves. This is the way the process of dismantling um, the dictatorship started in Spain, at least if we speak about the memory of the victims. It started from below, thanks to a group of committed people, frequently the grandsons and granddaughters of the victims. So through the channels of civil society, the institutional absence and ambiguity started to change at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, however, as I said, the debate in Spain about historical memory is still today cause for political confrontation. The conservative popular party currently in office has openly shown his doubts about the exhumation of the graves and about any kind of memory policy that remembers the, vic the victims. The representatives of the party have always declared that remembering the war and the dictatorship means to reopen held old, old wounds and they claim we must look to the future and discuss the problems of the present and not of the past. Another institution that prefers not to remember the past is the Catholic Church. The ecclesiastical authorities have frequently remembered the well-documented violence against the members of the church during the war, and that's right, it's, it has to be remembered. A recent study calculates that 6,629 uh, 6, members of the church were assassinated during the war. But the church seems not to be ready to talk about other memories, which tells, uh, which tells us that they actively collaborated with the dictatorship in the repression. For example, by denouncing the Republican parishioners, their Republican parishioners to state tribunals. The church worked hand in hand with Falange. The, uh, Falange was the, the, the only party, the sole party uh, during Franco dictatorship the military and the Guardia Civil in the persecution of Republicans during and after the war. According to, according to a big part of the Spanish political right wing, the traumas of the past were cured during the period of transition to democracy, thanks to the effort made at that time by the Spanish people and the political leaders. Those were the years when the two Spains, so-called two Spains, achieved reconciliation. According to this view, the civil war was a national tragedy in, in which both sides were equally guilty of committing atrocities. So reopening the debate is a sort of revenge of those who lost the war. Those who want to reopen the debate of the past are, they say, using the civil war as an argument for political propaganda and what is worse, weakening the political consensus reached during the transition to democracy. That is to say, speaking about the war and the victims of the dictatorship means to incite the population to, ha to hatred and hostility. On the other hand, for most of the political left during the transitional period, there wasn't such a reconciliation, but in the best case scenario, a temporary suspension of the necessary national dialogue about the past and in the worst, a choice for forgetting. So the memory of the dictatorship is a political issue that is complicating an open dialogue of our, on our recent past. But there is also the generational factor. 
If we see the results of the very few surveys conducted in Spain in order to know the opinion of the Spaniards about their recent past, we notice that younger generations' approach to memory is more flexible than their parents. So I think there is room for consensus in this issue too. Anyway, this confrontation was evident in, 19, um, in 2007 during the debates that led to the passing of the historical memory law. The social concern on historical memory had become intensified when in 2004 the Socialist Party came to office. The then Prime Minister José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero reacted to this atmosphere with the proposal of a historical memory law that was supposed finally to meet the demands of the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. After a long and controversial debate, the historical memory law was passed by the Congress of Deputies on 31 October 2007. The law recognized the victims of both sides of the Spanish Civil War, gives some right to the victims and the descendants of victims, and formally, which is very important, condemns the Franco regime. It is true that, that the historical memory law is a step forward and tries to inspire reconciliation and to some extent, as the, as the historian Julio Arostegui points out, the law is at its base respond to the, um, at its base, respond to the spirit uh, of a new generation, one which has been called more than, was, more than once the grandchildren of the world, who didn't leave it, but who have from <clears throat> it an inherited memory and who likewise didn't participate actively in the process of the transition. The law, in any case, present itself with this reconciliatory spirit of reparation or recognition of injustices." End of the quote. On the other hand, it is not less true, however, that the law is full of binding articles and recommendations and doesn't meet some of the core demands of the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. For example, the responsibility of the state in finding and opening the mass graves or the cancellation of the sentences given by Francoist court martial. Needless to say, the Conservative Popular Party voted against passage of the law and since and since they came to office in 2011, the law is de facto repealed at the national level because it is a, a ridiculous budget allocation for its implementation. Uh, well, so here we are with a lot to do in the near future to reach some kind of consensus around the past. Finally, my, by means of conclusion, let me highlight some personal reflections on the future of memory in Spain. <coughs> If you compare the Spanish case to others in Europe, it's clearly visible that we arrived late to the reparation of the crimes committed in the 20th century. However, this delay doesn't mean that coming to terms with our past is not necessary anymore. In Spain, there wasn't nothing like a truth commission after the, dictation, the dictator death. The missing persons remained missing and forgotten by the authorities and there wasn't a real symbolic dismantling of the old regime, nor an official condemnation of the dictatorship during the transition period. In contrast to Italy or Germany, Spanish fighters against fascism didn't become national hero heroes, this being the state of things, Francoism, and especially Francoist repression, is still the main issue regarding historical memory in Spain. It's not the only one, but it's the main issue. There is not a miraculous answer to memory issues, but in spite of everything, I believe that memory is the previous step to a real social reconciliation. It seems to me that without coming to terms with the past, you only can build a new project of society over quicksand. If you do so, the result will be probably unstable and sooner or later the traumas of the past will be back. In the case of Spain, that happened, in my opinion, during the period of transition to democracy. It would be a waste of time to repeat the same mistake 40 years after. It's not always, always easy to ask for forgiveness. However, sometimes forgiveness becomes essential to build a better relationship for the future. And that goes for persons, communities and institutions, both sides, of course. 
It is my belief that in order to start a real reconciliation in Spain, institutions like the army, the Catholic Church, and of course all the political party, parties should categorically and solemnly condemn the dictatorship. Those institutions that had a central role in repression as the army should definitely ask for forgiveness. And so essentially, it's also, in my view, a, commi a commitment from the government, both regional and national, to basic uh, human rights matters, like, again, the responsibility of the state in finding and opening the mass graves or the cancellation of the sentences given by Franquist court martial. This would be an excellent first step to national reconciliation that would make easier the dialogue between different actors with also different positions. I think that building a common new narrative of our past has to be a participative process. We must extend the debate beyond the universities, the political parties and the associations for the recovery of historical memory. But how to do that? A proper communication policy to put memory in the public agenda is one of the keys in my understanding of the matter. It wouldn't be a bad idea uh, for the different organizations working for the recovery of historical memory to join together and reclaim that participative debate, at least in state media. To be effective, the debate, needless to say, must be as participative, honest and plural as possible, so the Spanish citizens felt themselves represented in it. I believe, I believe that a slow, unhurried debate in a calm tone and with human rights as an essential topic for the discussions might achieve the basic consensus. But this time a consensus reached through citizen participation and not as an imposition from above. So I think memory policies should work hand in hand with communication policies that would regulate the participation process in the national debate and at the same time guarantee the visibility of it. This is important, of course. If we manage to achieve consensus through participation, it will be probably easier to build a critical narrative of our common past. That narrative should help us to look towards the future with hope and less resentment. There is too much at stake. It's in our hands to take it serious, seriously and get to work. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm. Uh, Miguel, thank you very much for your uh, very inspiring lecture and the overview of the memory politics in Spain. Actually, uh, I understand that the uh, Baltic region is uh, not so far away from Spain <laughs> as uh, we can uh, imagine when we travel to Spain uh, because we have uh, many similarities in the politics of uh, traumatic memories after the totalitarian regime and what you have actually stressed, the uh, participation of different groups is also very important uh, because the question is who remembers uh, who is included and who is excluded. So this is also the topical issue for Latvia. That's why I think we should probably start the debates, the questions, comments, uh, uh, all the comments are uh, welcome and acceptable. <coughs> we are quite inclusive in our debate, so please, if you have any questions, yes, please. Yes, uh, I, I would like to ask a question. For example, in, in Latvia, we have uh, that, uh, for example, these, these who were like, um, repressed by the, the Soviet government, they have like um, official benefits. For example, they they have uh, maybe like a free transportation in the public uh, transportation system. For example, or discounts in uh, for some government services. For example, uh, how how is this in Spain? Uh, do you do you have such kind of uh, like uh, victims which are uh, like recognized uh, officially as, as victims? Um, do you have uh, any, any kind of support from, from the government? Well, uh, this is one of the keys of, uh, of the, um, the key points in the um, law for historical memory I have just quoted. But the problem is, so uh, in the law you can read that yes, 
the, it, uh, they, it has to be some kind of uh, economic compensa compensation to the victims. But this is not happening. This is not happening because the law almost doesn't work. The, the, the law was uh, stopped it from uh, 2011 because there is no budget to uh, implement the law. So uh, in real terms, uh, it has been done very little in that direction, very, very little. Yeah, I was to ask, uh, maybe it's a bit outside of the scope of your presentation, but still, uh, could you draw some parallels or perhaps compare the situation in Spain in terms of remembering the Franco and all around and um, uh, the situation in, say, some Latin American countries where mm -hmm. I see many commonalities, many similarities? There are commonalities, of course, but uh, I think we have a lot to learn from Latin, from Latin America, from some countries in Latin America. Uh, because, uh, for example, we have the uh, Argentinians, Argentinians dictatorship, which was quite uh, not similar because uh, there are big differences. But they managed to uh, create a truth commission. This happened in Guatemala too, for example. Uh, in Chile, it's is uh, more or less the case, but they started a bit later. But uh, they, they are still uh, doing something. Uh, the problem in Spain is that uh, I think we don't understand the amount of the problem, so the, the, the scale of the problem, because we have uh, too many missing people. And we, in, in 40 years after the death of Franco, we didn't sit down, uh, look each other to the eyes and say, this is impossible, this is a basic question of human rights. Let's don't uh, talk about politics, about uh, the Socialist Party or the Popular Party. Let's think about uh, thousands, of thousands of people disappeared. And no government had take this like an uh, 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 important responsibility. This is happening. This is happening in some countries in Latin America. That's why I say that uh, uh, the, the, there are uh, no uh, perfect uh, solutions, but I think this is basic in Spain. So. Any other questions? Oh, there are two on the Okay, I just uh, wanted to ask if you consider that uh, today's Spanish society has changed thank, uh, thanks to this uh, Franco regime and how and what aspect uh, in relation to the youngest generation? Uh, uh, you mean uh, which kind of uh, changes? Like cultur culturally. Mm -hmm. the younger generation are actually aware what has happened? Hmm. As a uh, the problem is, I, I think, um, I, I teach in university and, and, and when they came to our university, they, they have just finished the secondary school uh, and they have a, a history of Spain in, in secondary school. But the, the, the thing is, um, they also, they very often say to me that uh, as the civil war is at the end of the book, they uh, not always uh, come to, to, to say, to, to, to know nothing, to know anything about this. It's, uh, okay, it, it seems to, to be a, a joke, but, it, but it's very, very real and very, very often. So I think there is a, a, a big lack of knowledge uh, about the period especially about Francoism. And uh, if, if we speak about repression, this is the main, uh, the main claim of this association for the recovery of historical memory, because repression has been silenced. We speak about Franco, of course, we speak about the civil war, but uh, the general idea is that uh, both sides committed atrocities, which is true, which is true. But the scale was very different. That is true also, and, and it has to be said. 
because it was different. But uh, suffering, uh, again, was everywhere, of course. It was a civil war. We were killing each other. But uh, um, the scale and the thing that, and the fact that the, uh, just one side's victims were silenced is the real uh, concern of these associations. So, in terms of uh, culturally what they think, uh, the young people in Spain, I can't, I can't really say because, I, I, as I said uh, um, before, uh, there are very little, so, uh, very a, a little, uh, a small number of surveys about these issues, which is important too. Hmm? Which is important too. I think we have to make a diagnostic, a better diagnostic of uh, who we are as a society in this uh, sort of memory issue. Hmm? And there was also one more question to now. Yes. Um, Hi, uh, Dr. Lenn, insist upon the uh, 2007 law which you mentioned, Professor, which was passed, you seem to find fault in the fact that it didn't represent the interests or the opinions of the uh, Association for the Republic mm -hmm. of Historical Memory. Um, that, of course, is, uh, is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder whether that is the role of, of uh, Parliament and, uh, and the legal system. I do have my personal opinion on the, on the matter, but um, that, that doesn't seem to me, at least theoretically, to, to be a fault with the, with the law. I would just like to say that uh, there is a very lively debate on historical memory. Uh, there is indeed uh, problems in the uh, education curriculum. Uh, some areas are not sufficiently covered. But we would have to go into the particularities of the Spanish system yeah. where the government, the central government is not responsible for the education curriculum and secondary uh, education. So we would have to go into a lengthy debate as to who is responsible for what in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, nonetheless, there's a very lively debate. I think you will concur with me. Even if it's absent from parliament, certainly, uh, from certain areas of the public discourse, and uh, even though the mainstream uh, narrative of mainstream discourse remains uh, challenged in some respects. That debate is going on, and we do have a pretty successful constitution. I think we should uh, we should agree on that. That allows for uh, change. It allows for the 2007 law. It allows for uh, changes of the constitution itself, which is a good thing. And uh, if uh, the momentum and generation of change that uh, you were mentioning has indeed huge importance, we're not minimizing the importance of, uh, of that change. Uh, should we get to a moment where Spanish society feels that the moment has come for a different approach, uh, the legal mechanisms are there. They're very, very clear. The Constitution allows for them. We've recently allowed for a very successful transition uh, in the position of the head of state. It allows uh, very clearly for the mechanisms for uh, legal change, constitutional change. And uh, these are just things that I would like to, to emphasize. Uh, drawing to a final, I guess, uh, observation or, or conclusion in my words, that um, it would seem from, from the presentation that uh, memory, historical memory, is the only divisive topic in Spanish society. And, uh, were we to come to an agreement of that, we would all be healed and uh, together as a nation. I can personally doubt that would be the case. Mm -hmm. It's very terrible that uh, we come to terms with history, but uh, that's far from the cure to society's ills. As defined, and uh, I come to a conclusion with this, um, we have uh, we have another problem for our people, which uh, Nagy also faces. We're together in. Uh, the issues of uh, historical memory grows together in the issues of uh, the financial crisis and uh, the 
dire straits in which we find ourselves. Um, that said, um, that's a problem that is uh, certainly very, very divisive in Spanish society today. And it also accounts for the fact that uh, uh, no man was allocated to the provisions and uh, the uh, law of historical memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me a bit a bit misleading to say, uh, to see that um, without mentioning that a whole lot of other policies are also going uh, without, without enough finance. It's easy to find a political, uh, to find a political will behind uh, that fact, which I do not dispute. But the fact remains that many other areas of policy are uh, not financed or underfinanced, and we need to have a whole perspective of the budgetary choices before we see what is, before we come to a conclusion with uh, how we are dealing with uh, historical memory. I don't think uh, I have uh, taken too long. I just wanted to offer these uh, few additional remarks. And again, thank the professor for a very interesting and uh, mm -hmm. excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for your questions. Just uh, saying something. Uh, about your last um, doubts about the um, budget. Yes, you're right. We are in Spain cutting everything in too much, probably. Mm. But I would disagree in with, uh, with your point, because you say there is no political will of this. It's just part of the situation and the economical crisis. But uh, the thing is, uh, Mariano Rajoy, which is uh, this day our president, uh, when he was in, a, in an um, electoral campaign, he promised to uh, cancel the law of historical memory. So he, wa he wasn't especially um, in good terms with the law. Um, if in June, for example, 2006, the Spanish Parliament declared uh, that year, 2006, the year of historical memory. The Popular Party voted against. In, 19, in 2007, the Popular Party also voted against the historical memory law. In 2012, the government of Mariano Rajoy uh, cut in a sick, in a um, in a, um, in a 60 percent the budget dedicated to the implementation of the historical memory law. In the same year, the government of the Polit Popular Party suppressed the office for victims of the civil war and the dictatorship, which was supposed to coordinate the exhumation of the mass graves. In 2008, during the electoral campaign, as I said, the, the then candidate Mariano Rajoy said that in case of becoming president, he would repeal the historical memory law. That's why I see a political uh, intention in this. But, of course, using a general excuse, which is the economic crisis. I, in, in that sense, I, I, would, I think there is a political factor, too. Thank you. Well, then there was another question. Yeah, uh, I want to, you know, to cut to this region your topic and ask, yeah. taking, taking into consideration the uh, historical background of all this, you, of your presentation, yeah. uh, how much it would be sound to argue or justified to argue that uh, the anti-Franco stances or attitudes, uh, representations, uh, uh, are feeding or, or nurturing uh, a pro-Soviet mm -hmm. way of thinking about the Soviet Union. Do you see any links or are there any indications which could substantiate uh, or, or, or... The thing is, it's funny because uh, maybe uh, the... Because when you um, were talking, I was thinking about not just, not, not ab about the Soviet Union, but current Russia, because it's, uh, because it's a, a very interesting situation I have m met uh, very, very often. So, um, 
Well, I think Vladimir Putin is far from being a uh, left wing, but uh, 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 he, his uh, policy plays very well, not only in Spain, plays very well with uh, left wing parties in, in Europe, in some parts of Europe. I don't know why, but I think maybe it's because that uh, anti-Americanism, which is in very in a lot of places in in, in the world, but it also in Europe. So in, they are identifying from the left wing, not always, of course, but I have uh, met this. Uh, so the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that's all. <laughs> that is my argument. Uh, I see the the influence more in this direction, not uh, because the Soviet Union, uh, well. Uh, it, you, mm, this kind of propaganda played very well in the 40s, of course. You have to take into account that when the Second World War finished, uh, the, let's say, friends of Franco were falling. So Hitler, Mussolini supported Franco during the uh, Civil War, <coughs> and then Franco a bit because Spain was crushed, uh, supported Mussolini and Hitler. Uh, so Franco felt, I'm the next, probably in some moment. Uh, and he started to emphasize this propaganda message of we are the champions against the Soviet Union. So you think that I'm better than a any other possibilities in Spain. So I'm your man in Spain if you want to fight communism here. So it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. okay, so. Well, and uh, well, time is running fast. We still have time for one more final question. If there is Yes, I understand. Real, real, mm -hmm. like, uh, not, not the moral, moral work you create, but uh, real, uh, real political crimes or, or repression. No, no, this means there are there are any like uh, trials uh, in courts with mm -hmm. somebody who was tried. Uh, we didn't, we didn't have a Nuremberg process, for example. N nothing like that happened in Spain. Nothing like that. On the contrary, we did have a law, it's the law of amnesty in 1977 that covers all political crimes due to 1976. And at that moment, it could be a good idea, maybe, uh, because in Franco's prisons, there were a lot of political prisoners. So just not to case by case analyze what happened, just political crimes, and they uh, went out of, the, uh, of jail. But at the same time, the same law had a different uh, result, which was, uh, it, mm, how to say, it's, it stopped the possibility for judging uh, political crimes during the uh, dictatorship. So no trials, no truth commissions were held. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much once again for your presentation, for the debates and the answers, and thank you all to, for your questions and comments. Uh, well, uh, let's hope this is not the last debate. Luckily, we uh, don't have enough debates and lectures on this issue. I think it's never enough. 
Uh, that's why uh, I hope we will continue. Well, thank you very much and, and have a nice evening and we will uh, meet uh, somewhere uh, some, sometime again uh, to continue the debates. Thanks a lot. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you.